past decade, John Logan has become one of Hollywood's most prolific screenwriters. His films range from epics like Gladiator and The Last Samurai to Star Trek Nemesis, The Aviator, Any Given Sunday and Sweeney Todd. In the past couple of years, he has written animated comedy Rango, adapted Shakespeare's Coriolanus and worked with Martin Scorsese again on 3D period adventure Hugo. He has proved to be perhaps the most versatile of contemporary screenwriters. And it is this variety in Logan's work that continues to dazzle. By the time I wrote my first screenplay, I'd been, I'd been a starving playwright for 10 years in Chicago. And I mean starving, and I mean 10 years. And you know, my job was shelving books in a library, and I did it for 10 years, and I wrote plays. And I worked with starving directors and starving actors and starving theaters that closed in a night you know, to learn how to be a dramatist. If you want to be a screenwriter, a successful screenwriter, here's the secret. Here it is. I'm going to tell you. This is what you have to do. It's great. Don't tell anyone. You have to read Hamlet and you have to read it again, and you have to read it again, and you have to read it until you understand every word. And then you move on to King Lear, and then maybe you treat yourself to Troilus and Cresta, and then you know what? Then you're gonna go back and read Aristotle's Poetics until you can quote it. And then you read Sophocles, and then you read Ibsen, and then you're gonna read Tony Kushner, and then you're gonna read Chekhov. You're gonna understand the continuum of what it is to be a dramatist. Then, if you choose, watch a couple movies. But the great mastery of being a dramatist, of writing words for characters, will be taught to you by those people who invented the form over centuries. My favorite sort of anecdote about screenwriters uh, came to me from the writers of uh, Man on the Moon and People vs. Larry Flint. And straight out of film school, they sold their first script. And their agent called them up and said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is I've sold the script for, you know, X hundred thousand dollars. The bad news is you're fired. And that's kind of, you know, indicative of, of Hollywood, really, is that writers, it's just this conveyor belt of writers and they're happy to just kind of fire one after another after another just to get the script in enough shape that they can shoot the movie. There is a notion that what cinema is is pictures, you know, and it's beautiful moving pictures, and it's, it's a sweep and nuance of visual storytelling. It certainly is that. Um, but it is also language. It is also characters expressing themselves through dialogue, and dialogue has become so devalued uh, in movies, which is why when, when, when someone asked me, what do you want, you realize, I said, I want speeches, I want language, I want tripping language, I want nuance, I want Kate Hepburn synapses firing so quickly you can't keep up, like I learned from Pinter, you know. Um, so what I say to young writers is, read your Shakespeare, you know, read your Shelley, read your Keats, read your Byron, love language. When I was starting out and I didn't know what a slug was or interior meant or fade to meant or how you organize the words on a page of a screenplay, people talked to me. You know, elder statesmen talked to me and, were, and, were, and shepherded me through the process. My first screenplay, Any Given Sunday, which I co-wrote with Oliver Stone, uh, I hadn't written anything. And he took the time to teach me how it worked. We, we did 26 drafts of Any Given Sunday, one after another. So I learned everything about the form from him. He read it, he was patient. You know, I'd go to his house, he'd say, pick up the Oscar, hold it, it'll feel good, you'll enjoy it, you know. <laughs> and then we'd work. And, and Any Given Sunday, like all these monstrous big movies, are, are, it was hard to get made. These are, these are behemoths. They're like, it's like, you know, the Queen Mary doesn't tack quickly. You know, with Coriolanus, which we made for nothing, we could make quick adjustments. These things are huge beasts, and, it's, and they're very hard to get made, and it takes a lot of work. So in that case, I was not only doing the necessary work of a screenwriter, I was learning what the necessary work of a screenwriter was. I'll tell you this, in any fight, it's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You gotta look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're gonna see a guy who will go that inch with you. You're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're gonna do the same for him. But that's a team, gentlemen. And either we heal now as a team, or 
or we will die as individuals. As football guys. That's all it is. I had to learn sort of the visual metaphor of film because so much of film is visual. Uh, and you know, cinema's pictures and moving pictures. So for me, it was learning the balance between dialogue, dialogue scenes, and visual action and how those segue back and forth and trying to reduce the dissonance between them so it seemed one, uh, one, one whole unit. I'd like to talk about what it is you do mm. uh, in terms of do you write on a computer, do you write in longhand, when do you write, um, you know, do you do outlines, do you do treatments? Take, take me through the process yeah. and what's an, you know, what's an average day for you writing? Right. The, the typical day is I, I, I personally get up very early, I get up at four. Um, because I've found sort of the hush of silence and darkness very conducive to me writing. Because um, the phone's not ringing, there's no distractions, it's, it's just me and, and the, the sort of whimsical little characters moving about. Um, so so I, I start very early, I write until I'm tired, and then I stop. And if I'm writing a first draft, um, it's, it's total immersion. I don't do anything else, and I can work for 12 hours of stretch, take a break, go back and work, because my methodology is always do the research first, as much as it takes. And for something like... I mean, the most research I ever did was probably The Aviator. Well, I developed that with, with uh, Michael Mann for years, and we discussed it, and I did outlines, I did research, and we discussed who Howard Hughes is, what the shape of the movie is, how much of his life to... You know, while I was doing the research, um, it was a, a daily, uh, you know, a daily engagement with a filmmaker, uh, and sometimes that's the case. But at any point I sit down to write it, I just seal myself away, and I just write. And I can write anywhere. As long as I'm facing a blank wall, I can write in hotel rooms, I can write in L.A., I can write in New York, I can write in London, it makes no difference. Because once I start, I'm just sort of committed to it. And my, my object is to write as quickly, the entire thing as quickly as possible. And so it's also very ugly, but, it, but I just like to get from beginning to end. Um, and every day I convince myself I'm writing King Lear. I convince it's the greatest screenplay ever, it's the greatest thing that's ever been written in anything, you know? Uh, and, and at the end of that time, I go back and I work, you know, and I do the actual work, the actual revising, because writing is easy, it's the rewriting, where you have to really go in and put a, put a clinical analysis to your work that's, that's um, grinding. Then when I feel the entire piece is done to a shape that I feel is at least respectable, and I'm not totally embarrassing myself, and will lose my entire career based on this one awful draft, I'll give it to my, my collaborators. And then um, it becomes public property. And, it, and it, it's always the most poignant part of the process for me is, is, is sort of when you open the door and let people into the room. Before yeah. the first draft, do you outline, do you treatment? I mean, I do, I do, I outline. I do, I do sort of like three or four page outlines with sometimes just bullet points of like, um, you know, uh, Sweeney Todd kills Judge Turpin, you know, or it could be longer, it could be a description of some images. If, if I'm working with a director, for example, who, who is, who's very good on images, you know, developing the aviator with, with Michael Mann, there were certain images that would come out, he just loved the visual sweep of them, I would make notes on those so I'd remember to include them or at least play around with those, you know, with those, those aspects. But yeah, I usually have a, an outline. I work on a, a computer, it's, it's very, I work in my bathroom, it's very, very quiet and really terrible and interesting. <laughs> There's a huge amount of information in a, in a John Logan script. I read a few of them in preparation for the lecture and every kind of, he, he tends to put camera moves, if somebody walks away, if somebody looks sad, if somebody looks happy, all of that is in the, in the script. It's, it's a line, it's a word, but there's so much information that is presented in a John Logan script. And obviously then a director comes along and he can interpret that. But Logan doesn't just have a person walks into a room and that's it. He'll describe what the person's doing, his emotion, very simply but effectively. One of the best pieces I ever got in my advice in my career was Ridley Scott on Gladiator. And it was very simple. It was write less words. I'm like, okay, I can do that, you know. And so, so some of my first drafts are, are monstrously long, you know. And I should probably be more disciplined, but you know, why not? It's a first draft. Go, go and explore. You might, you might discover that that sort of ugly little, you know, little little sort of troll over there is going to be a beautiful, a beautiful angel. You just have mm. to sort of let them run around. So, when you handing your first draft, how many drafts is that for you? Does before you. Dozens, dozens, and you know, and it's it's the process for me of, you know, here's here's like you know, I'm not much for lecturing about the craft of screenwriting. I mean, if we were talking about playwriting, I could I could speak about playwriting, but you know, screenwriting since as you heard, I just sort of fell into it and discovered it along the way. Here's one piece of advice I can give you: um, don't be afraid of the big line. Don't be afraid to reach for the big line. 
because I personally have very little interest in movies that sound like people just sitting around a table talking. That's not my, that's not the cinema that draws me. And I think audiences are also drawn to um, the aspiration to the big moment. But you know, you're sitting in there in your bathrobe in Chicago at seven in the morning, it's easy to type a line like, at my single, unleash hell. <laughs> it takes nerve to give that line to Ridley Scott, you know, and say, yes, Maximus is gonna say this line, and it's gonna work, you know, and so, so reach for the big line and don't be afraid. But the process of working for me is, is sometimes getting the nerve up to say, you know what, I am gonna go for the huge dramatic moment because that's what this movie requires. Or, <laughs> conversely, I'm gonna go for the incredibly quiet, subtle moment with the last thing you would, you know, the last moment you'd, you'd expect it. Those are the things that take sort of nerve and time and rewrite and sort of adjudication of, of the, the form and the piece mm. for me. I always think being a dramatist, you have to be an incredible extrovert and an incredible introvert, and you must enjoy solitude. You know, the, the great, the great uh, necessary gene for a writer is silence and love of silence and respect for silence. I came on to Gladiator when Ridley Scott came on, and he, he wanted me to come on. The first thing I did is sat down with Bill Nichol with, with David Franzoni, who wrote the original draft. I said, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you want. Let's talk about what I want. Let's talk about sharing back and forth. <laughs> and then when I left, when production started, and Bill Nicholson came in, it was the exact same thing. It was a complete sharing. So at the end of the day, when that movie came out, we three were incredibly uniformly proud of the work we had all done, and sort of proud of each other. And I remember the Oscars was unbelievable because there was, there was such a, a sense of reflected glow between all three of us. And the other sort of co-writing experience I've had, which was Last Samurai, was the same thing with Ed Zwick and Marshall Horskowitz. It was complete freedom and transparency back and forth. Now, I know that's not always the case. You know, I've been, I've been lucky, or I've been tenacious, or I've been stubborn, or I've been stupid, but I've never had the bad experience of, of just similar being fired, thrown off a movie, and having someone come in, and then not being involved or engaged uh, whatsoever. I think that would be, would be killing. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North, general of the Felix Legions. Loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Father to a murdered son. Husband to a murdered wife. And I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. In movies, you're looking for the visual metaphor. You're looking for, for that image or sequence of images that will suggest what on stage would be a theatrical effect or uh, perhaps a line of dialogue or an exchange between characters. So when I put my sort of movie brain on, it's, it's sort of the eyebrow raise and you're thinking about, all right, so the character's feeling this, what am I showing? What are we seeing that's reflecting or conversely in some way in contradiction to that? Sweeney Todd's a great example because everything that Tim and, and, and Dante did in building that world is a very unified world. So at every moment you think you're in Sweeney Todd's psyche. There's, no mo there's only the one moment of blue sky, which is clearly Mrs. Lovett's fantasy. So you know, of all my movies, I think that's the most, um, it's one of the ones of which I'm most proud of my part, but it's also one of the most true to the idea that a movie can sometimes function very well within the, individual sort of nuances and psyches of its, of its protagonist. I think Lawrence of Arabia is another movie that, that does that. I think Psycho does that as well. How about a shave? Sit, sir. Sit. Pretty women. Pretty women, yes. Jana, Jana. Pretty women. Pretty women are a wonder. Pretty women. What we do for you with Blowing out the candles Oh, coming out there Coming out there And they leave Even when they leave you and vanish They somehow can still remain there I mean, the thing about John Logan is he's incredibly versatile. I mean, from Bond to Star Trek, from Rango to Shakespeare. But there's, you know, it doesn't matter if it's an animated chameleon or a gladiator, he just gets the emotion, he gets the characters, he gets the detail, um, and he gets the drama. I mean, maybe that's because he comes from theatre, but he kind of understands that 
there should be emotion, there should be story. How do you choose the products that you want to work on? Oh, cool. is, is it, is it yeah. uh, the characters? Is it the world? Is it the story? I mean, what, how yeah. do you select them? Because clearly you must be offered lots of things all the time. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, a, it's a number of things. It's, usually it's either something about the story or a character appeals to me, and I think that's in my swing circle. Um, uh, you know, whether it's something, I'm doing this, I'm doing, um, Patti Smith wrote this book called Just Kids about her relationship with Robert Maplethorpe, uh, and that's the next thing I'm doing. Patti and I are sort of collaborating on it together. There was something about that relationship when I read that book that deeply moved me, and I said, that's a story I want to tell, you know. Um, or it can be uh, a character that appeals to me. I mean, I mean, the aviators, uh, I, was, I looked at Howard Hughes and I said, that's an amazingly complex character. I could turn that character for years because these big movies take years. And you have to be, if, you're not, if, you, if you lose interest in your protagonist, you're f So it's like I'm drawn to those characters who I don't understand, who I find interesting. And as much so, the people I'm working with. It's my collaborators. It's, you know, who's the director, who are the stars, what's the studio, who's the executives, are they people that are gonna make this a challenging and rewarding experience for me. Mm. And in the process of something like uh, The Aviator, for example, where I developed that with, with uh, Michael Mann for years, and we discussed it, and I did outlines, I did research, and we discussed who Howard Hughes is, what the shape of the movie is, how much of his life to, you know, while I was doing the research, um, it was a, a daily, uh, you know, a daily engagement with a filmmaker. Given Hughes' kind of colourful <laughs> life, shall we say, uh, why did you choose that period, and how did you kind of focus on that period? Was that yeah. something that came before the research that you, or was yeah, it? No, no, no. It, it was, it was, this, this is, this is, yeah, this is a very good example of how sort of, at least my process works, which, so Leonardo DiCaprio called Michael Mann said, I, 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 heard, I read this Howard Hughes book, it's really interesting, why don't we do a Howard Hughes movie? So Michael Mann, who's a director I admire very much, and we'd been trying to find something to do to it, we discussed various things, came to me and said, how about Howard Hughes from Leonardo DiCaprio? And I said, yes. Instantly, in the room, I knew exactly I had to do that movie, because I knew enough about Hughes to know there was a story there. And my next year became figuring out what that story was for me. And if you were to hand Howard Hughes's life to um, you know Bill Nicholson or Charlie Kaufman or Bill Condon, you know Eric Roth. You'd get a completely different movie because every artist is going to approach it from a different um, perspective. So I started reading all the all the biographies about Hughes, of which of w w they are legion, you know. And I just read them all, and then uh, things began to appeal to me. You know, early movies began to appeal to me, and particularly aviation began to appeal to me <laughs> as as a framework because there was something about. Um, Hughes's response to aviation that was psychologically motivated about being in an antiseptic safe environment at 30,000 feet that I found very compelling as a way for me to understand his germ phobia. So it's it sort of all these things sort of came together and I realized it was, a, it was a movie about planes. It was a movie about aviation for me and Hughes as an engineer. Not Hughes as a movie maker, not Hughes as an obsessive compulsive, not Hughes as a lover, not Hughes as a, as a famous paranoiac or recluse. It was Hughes as an engine, engineer and man who wanted to fly, but his germ phobia kept him on the ground. I thought, well, there's a character being torn in half, and that's really interesting to me as, as, as a dramatist. The, the thing about Howard Hughes is that the sort of germophobia that he had, that he's sort of infamous for. And Logan put a little scene at, right at the beginning of the movie where his mother is bathing him as a child, and she kind of mentions being dirty. And then all the way through the film, he, Logan just drops these little kind of moments. Nothing kind of drawn attention to the fact that the scream kind of germs, 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 but he just has these little thing, these little seeds that he puts through. I think one of my favorite scenes is, is the scene where Kate Hepburn and Howard Hughes meet and they go play golf. And you just think, well, it's a first date scene. How do, how do you write a first date scene? Why, why is that interesting? Because those personalities should never be on the same golf course, much less in the same movie. So to get to play with her hyper-prolix vocabulary and learning and his sort of monotone, half-deaf autism was, was challenging, very fulfilling, uh, fulfilling to write. But, you know, I could say the same thing of, of being able to write Patrick Stewart sitting in the, you know, the, the command chair of the Enterprise or, or you know, Russell Crowe in Gladiator. There, there's, been, there's been many great moments that I've been, I've been proud to be... Uh, associated with. I keep healthy. I take seven showers a day to keep clean. Also because I'm what's so vulgarly referred to as outdoorsy. Well, I'm not outdoorsy. I'm athletic. I sweat. There it is. Now we both know the sort of truth. I sweat and you're deaf. Aren't we a fine pair of misfits? If you're dealing with 
Marcus Aurelius from, from Gladiator, or Howard Hughes from, from The Aviator, or Orson Welles from Arcade 281, what I always say is, is this, isn't, this isn't life, this isn't biography, this isn't fact, this is fiction, this is drama, this is make-believe, this is fantasy. I'm not a historian. This is not reportage. It's drama. You know, The same way you know, the approach to T.E. To e. Lawrence or Lawrence Arabia is, is a work of drama. And no, Lawrence certainly didn't look like, like Peter O'Toole, and these weren't the exact events in the erect order. I do feel it's important to be true in some way to the spirit of the character you're trying to portray, um, but not the letter. And I would, I would feel, personally, it would be an act of bad faith to in any way take a character and break it for, for dramatic ends. I think, I think you can bend it to a certain degree within the limits of, of probity, but if you, you break it, you, you would feel, I've done that a few times, and it feel, I always feel awful about it. Mm. Yeah. You've got Tom Cruise, you've got Johnny Depp, you've got Russell Crowe, you've mm. got Leonardo DiCaprio, actors who mm -hmm. bring lots to, to their performance and mm -hmm. the role. Can you talk a little bit about sort of each of those and working with them and how yeah. they... Yeah, I mean, it, because, because, again, my experience is, um, as a playwright, you know, I'm used to talking to actors. It's what, you know, playwrights talk to actors all the time. There isn't, you know, because the, the, the director, as we know it, in theater was only, is only an invention of the 19th century and is a very new conceit. Um, there's no sense of, of, of divinity around the director in the theater, nor do I consider uh, there to be divinity around the, the idea of a director on, on a movie set. Um, not a lot of writers necessarily feel that, but that's just it's my experience and, and what I feel. So I'm very comfortable talking to directors and I'm very comfortable talking to actors. Part of my job is, as a playwright and as a dramatist and a screenwriter <coughs> is to help, is to, is, to, is to hear the language and engage. Because finally, the words on the page are the words on the page, and boy heavens, I'm proud of them. But they only live when they're spoken, either on stage or they're spoken into, into a camera and they're recorded. So it, it behooves me to be engaged in that process. And I orally need to hear it. I need to hear the words you know, out loud. I need to hear them coming from the actors to understand the rhythms, the cadences of the language. And what I will say to actors, any actor, is, look, if this doesn't sound right coming out of your mouth, let's talk about it. Are there too many syllables? Are there not enough? Is the ellipses in the wrong place? Is the punctuation confusing you? Do you not like the semicolon? Let's find a way to make it work together. Because I'm a great believer in Jerome Robbins' single rule of the theater, which is, does it work? It is imperative to hear the material out loud, imperative. And coming from the theater, it's just what you're used to. to me, you're, you're, you know, the oral life of the piece is vitally important, and it's frequently the aspect that's given the least attention in filmmaking, is the sound of the words and the dialogue and the rhythms of the speech. Uh, and it's really, it's really very important to me, coming, coming from a theater background and loving sort of prosody and poetry and, and literature as much as I do, how the words sound, how the actors say the sound is, is very important. So what I always say to actors is, look, if this doesn't come out of your mouth for a certain reason, if it's not working for you, let's discuss it and find something that works. Because it's like Jerome Robbins' great rule of theater, and there's only one. Does it work? It's not about my ego. It's not about Johnny Depp's ego. It's about are we making the right movie? Are we making the best possible movie we can? So, so the give and take with actors is to me a thrilling part of the process because it's, it's where the, the words and the language start coming, coming alive. That's why I wish more film sets, more films would budget uh, rehearsals. Which is, which is not usually budgeted. Uh, and so you're lucky if you get a table read. So the poor screenwriter is like desperately trying to listen and take notes the one time he gets to hear it out loud to make suggestions in the oral life of his work. Uh, which is why like theater directors like Sam Mendes, you know, they understand that. So for Bond, for example, we're doing two solid weeks of rehearsal which believe me is unheard of. You know, to get into the room with me, with Sam, with the actors, and work the scenes. So when we get on the set, we know what we're trying to sort of communicate with them. You've talked about your love of Shakespeare. Mm. Um, how, did, how did that project come about? And Coriolanus came because of my, my absolute sort of besotted love of Shakespeare. And I've always loved Shakespeare. I've always wanted to sort of get into and do a film adaptation because I have been, I've been dissatisfied with some, I've been elated in others, and I thought I wanted, like, like every artist, to, to have a chance at it. And I've always thought Coriolanus was the one. It's, it's an unloved play that I love, with a, with a central character as, as dark and thorny and ugly as all the central characters I've ever written about, you know, those, those titanic, dark people. Uh, and I never thought anyone in the world would be interested in this until Brian Sibrel said, well, you know, Someone else likes Coriolanus as a movie, and it's Rafe Fiennes. I said, shut up. <laughs> so, um, so Rafe was coming to LA, where I lived at the time, and I went to his hotel, and I met him for the first time. And we started talking about Coriolanus, and I realized 10 seconds in, we saw the same movie, which is modern, 
upsetting, provocative, and the purpose of which would make the audience feel exactly like they did after a production of the play, a play we both loved. Uh, and I realized Rafe was a filmmaker. He wasn't an actor wanting to do a vanity project. Um, so we committed to doing it. There's no studio, there was no money, we just committed to doing it. So we spent weeks just talking about the script, talking about, we, we, we had the play, he sort of acted it out, kind of all of it, which was fun. Uh, you know, or speeches, or I'd just ask to do a speech, and we'd started shaping it in a modern context. We knew we wanted urban warfare, we knew we wanted sort of the modern political machinery to be reflected, we had no idea where we were gonna film it, what it was gonna look like. And so I wrote a screenplay, which, which was an adaptation of, of, of the play. And, and you know, every word of it is Shakespeare. It's been moved around. Characters have been eliminated. Characters have been conjoined. Uh, uh, characters die who don't die in the play. You know, we, we, we were muscular in our adaptation. But truly, I believe it is a, is a fantastic representation of, of Shakespeare's play. It is our version of it. And we cobbled the money together from a million sources. It was the hardest setting up of a movie I've ever been involved with and therefore the most rewarding. We made it for no money in Serbia, and it's, it is a completely pure vision of what we wanted to create. The good senators must be visited, from whom I have received not only greetings, but with the change of honors. I have lived to see and inherited my very wishes and the buildings of my fancy. Only there's one thing wanting, which I doubt not, but our room will cast upon thee. Good mother, I'd rather be their servant in my way than sway with them in theirs. You know, I, I started writing screenplays because I love movies. And, you know, I didn't grow up in the theater. I grew up in movies. And, you know, I, you know the, the, the stories that shaped my life growing up were, were Gunga Din. They were notorious, you know. And the storytellers who shaped my life, you know, weren't Ibsen and Chekhov. They were Howard Hawks and Alfred Hitchcock, you know, and Carol Reed. And I just always loved the power of, of cinema, of movies. And, and I wanted to be a part of it. Um, I never thought I would be. I was so happy in the theater. I was so content being a theater mouse and still am most content and most happy in, in the world of theater and rehearsal rooms. But films offer you something. You know, they offer you the sweep and the close up. And to get to be part of a continuum that includes those artists who inspired you when you were four, when you were five, you know, before you knew from Aristotle, before you knew from Tony Kushner, you knew from Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, you knew from Sean Connery and the, the, the Aston Martin and Goldfinger, you know, they, they, they were so a part of your DNA, of all of our DNAs, that I think I was just pulled to be part of that story as well. Mm -hmm.